story. <laughs> and like all good stories, it starts like this. Once upon a time, there was a father. And in case you can't figure that out, that's me. <laughs> this father had a wonderful little boy. He was very happy. But then one day he found out that his wife was going to have a little baby. So I pray, Lord, if it's your will, give me a little girl. And he did. I was the first person to hold her in my arms. And I looked at her and I said, Lord, make her like a mother. And he did. She was loving and giving and so good and so kind. But then I realized I was getting left out. <laughs> so I said, Lord, make her like me. And he did. She could drive a truck and a tractor. She could load hay and strip tobacco. Do you realize what you did? <laughs> but at the same time, she was opinionated. Emotional. <laughs> so I said, Lord, that's enough of that. <laughs> Make her like you. And he did. He gave her the desire to serve people. She loves people. She gave her life to be a nurse. She's brought people back from the dead. And she's held the hand of people and breathed their last breath. He gave her a heart for missions, and she's trekked all over the world. Pushed canoes up swollen rivers and laid on the floor while bullets whizzed outside so she could tell people about Jesus. But still, something was missing. So I said, Lord, make her happy. And she made you. You see that look on her face? I never saw that until she met you. And I'm grateful for that. Today I'm giving you the best thing I had to give. And I just wanted you to know before I do that how hard me and God's work to get her ready for that. <laughs> God's worked hard. Don't screw it up. You know, as I watched that, I obviously thought about my little girls and one day having to, to make a speech of that magnitude. But actually why I played it today is because it's how I feel about our transition. I feel uh, that way about you, just the way that that father felt about his daughter. I, I felt like God has done so much within us. God has really rescued and really uh, transformed and built up and created so many amazing stories right here in this room. And I feel like at the right moment, at the right time, that God has really led us in the situation that we're currently in, where I feel like he wants to do something so incredible and so amazing. And, and I do. I have, I have that heart. I have that heart as a pastor who essentially feels like he is giving uh, some amazing people. Because how many of you know the church is one thing and one thing alone? It's people. It isn't buildings and facilities, it's not names, it's not this or that. It, it is one thing entirely, it's people. And God's passion and his desire is that that thing that he gave everything for would expand and grow because what it means is not more chairs, not more instruments, not more stuff, but ultimately it just means more people. And when you think that way, uh, about your story, when we think that way about our story, it leads us because this video to me, it sets up uh, the, the, the kind of experience for certain conversations. 
I don't know how many of you can reflect back on certain conversations that you've had. Maybe it was the first conversation that your parents awkwardly had with you about puberty or sex or something strange or whatever. But there are those certain conversations that are had that basically create an inspiration and they, and they basically create a, a moment. And we're going to look at, uh, I guess, the, the certain conversation that Jesus had. And obviously during his time and during the culture of that day, uh, if somebody was coming to the end of their life, they, they would specifically gather the family around because they lived in close-knit community and they would, they would gather everybody around at that special moment so that they could convey uh, the very essence of their wisdom and everything that they had. And we, we find that Jesus has this conversation. It's called this farewell discourse in John 13 through 17. And he's obviously, like anybody who has one of those final conversations, he's, he's sa saved up, thought about, he's pondered, what type of words am I going to share so that I can, I can kind of give the absolute best uh, of myself, the heart, the passion that I have, so that they would then be able to be last, or left with these lasting words so that they would truly understand what I've done, who I am, what this thing that I've given everything for is supposed to feel like, look like, act like, and, and how we're supposed to navigate because it's not going to be difficult right now while I'm here with them. What's going to be difficult is when I leave and when things start to get difficult. And so we're going to pick up in John 14 and we're, we're going to read these words because I think they have a lot for us today. I think that, um, I don't know if you've ever had the talk, you know, your parents sat you down and had the talk. Am I the only one? My mom brought out a picture book. No, okay, it was like fifth grade and things are, you know, she calls you in the room and I'm like, this isn't, this is weird. Like, I don't know what's happening right now. <laughs> and then she sets me on the bed and, and she... She's telling me things are going to change. Things are going to change. What do you mean things are going to change? And she starts breaking some stuff down for me. And I was like, oh, things are going to change. <laughs> and I think that it's important to know, yes, Jesus was getting ready to die, but he also knew that he wasn't going to stay dead. So this isn't necessarily like the morning of, you know, the end of his life because he knew death couldn't hold him. He knew he would accomplish the goal that he came to accomplish and he knew that it was a transitional time. And, and that is where we're at right now. No one's dying. Let, I mean, today we are, you know, our, no one's dying. No one's dying aloud at all, that me. ever. <laughs> but, what, but what's happening is change is coming. And I feel like when Jesus brought the disciples together, they're just going along their normal business. Things are great. They're healing people. They're seeing miracles happen. They're starting to spread the word. I mean, when they go into a town, people know who they are. They've been old fish. They've been fishermen. They've been tax collectors. They've been the bottom of the barrel, but now they're starting to get recognition and things are great and they're comfortable and they're good. And they kind of, I mean, Jesus is exciting and he's fun. And so he's taking them on all these adventures and it's like he called them into the bedroom <laughs> and he's like, hey, let's talk. And he starts to, to say things are going to change. He didn't say those words, but in John 14 verse one, he says this, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. And that's where I'm going to start with. Brad can pick up in a second, but when you look at that word troubled, um, it's literally defined as anguish, uh, like gut-wrenching trouble, not the trouble that we knew, Taylor Swift's version of trouble or whatever. It's just like, it's pain. It's trouble, real. Trouble. Okay, Sorry, that's good. That's all right. Brad loves that song, by the way. <laughs> Something about dads who have daughters and who Taylor Swift. Love that song. Sorry. Okay, I know. Sorry. I'm sorry. It's true. Right, TJ? Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, so trouble's coming, and they're probably like, what are you talking about? Deep, this deep anguish that you're speaking of? I mean, things are great. Things are wonderful. But suddenly, they're probably starting to get a sense. Oh, like, okay, change is coming. What, what does that look like, Jesus? We need to know. But instead, he just says, trust in God. Trust also in me. So he's sitting them down. They're not troubled at this time, but he's letting them know change is coming. 
It's, it's coming down the road, whether it's today, whether it's three weeks from now, whether it's three months from now, change is coming, and I got to tell you what to do when it comes. He's gathering them together, telling them, and he's sharing what matters most. And so the first thing he wants them to know is change is going to be hard. There might be emotions that come along with change. I don't know about you, but if you're like me, change isn't always comfortable. The other night, I collapsed in bed, and I thought to myself, my life has been truly disrupted. Things were comfortable. I knew what was happening. I knew things were going. But no, now, like, I'm tired. This is uncomfortable. This is disrupted. But oh my gosh, the conversations that I had today were nothing else, nothing short of God ordained. I walked in completely throughout my day aware that God is alive and I'm alive and I'm tired and it's uncomfortable, but he's alive and he's doing something big in my heart. And I know that he's doing something big in Brad's heart. So I feel that that churning of discomfort and, and he's telling them change isn't easy, but trust. First he says, trust in God. They know God. They've been brought up in their, their Hebrew tradition to know God. They know his word. They know him from the, um, the Torah and all that they had studied. And then he said, trust also in me. And I feel like at this time, if Jesus had like an iPhone or a photo album or a scrapbook or something that he could whip out, he probably would whip it out. And he would probably flip to the page where he showed them when he, they all had turned water into wine. And they're at that wedding and they're, he's remembering, like, remember when that happened? And then maybe he'd flip the page to when Jairus' daughter was dying and, and then they were like walking to her house and this lady who had an issue of blood just touched their garments and then she was healed. And then Jairus' daughter basically came up from the dead or the time when those guys ripped the roof off the house and, and, and the lepers were cleansed and all of these things. He's flipping through and saying, trust God, trust what you know, but don't forget me. Don't forget what I have taught you. Don't forget what we've walked through. Don't forget the lessons we've learned. You just have to trust. So when that anguish and when that discomfort and when it comes, go back to what you know. Go back to his word. Go back to the things you've seen me do in your life. And I think that that bears true in all of us. When change comes individually, when we walk through things that aren't easy, when emotional trouble comes and anguish comes and discomfort sets in, the only thing we can cling to at that moment is trusting God, what his word says, and trusting what we've known. And looking at the things that that we've seen. I mean, when Desert Vista started out as a church, they were a couple years ahead of the two separate churches, the life at Scottsdale, and they saw financial, God provide majorly in financial ways and miracles and transitions of leaders and God be faithful year after year as when it seemed like things might not work out or things were difficult, God was faithful to those people and God was faithful to us when we planted our church and we started off in Scottsdale Community College and we didn't have a band. We had a guy with a guitar, so we put ads on Craigslist and we found a myriad of people who were talented from all over the valley and they came together and then we moved and moved and, and moved. moved and moved again. And, and, and God has been faithful when we've seen people that just met and actually were averted to each other but then end up together. Or we've seen people walk in the door and walk through. <laughs> That's Matt and Kristen, if you didn't know. She ran and he followed and he got her. He won. Praise the Lord. He won that heart. He worked hard. I had many talks. Kristen, just give him a chance. Just, he's, he's got a good heart <laughs> on his moped. But um, like we've seen God be faithful and we've walked through hard days. Family, your family members have passed away. We've walked through times when you've gotten married and you've celebrated and you've mourned. And we all have, yeah. haven't we? So I'm done talking. <laughs> That's my moment. But we trust God's faithfulness. So the next thing that Jesus says, though, is kind of bizarre. And if you've grown up in church or you've been to in any service before, you may have heard this verse because it goes, Jesus goes on to say, in my father's house, there are, some translations say there are many mansions. And for a lot of us, if we've grown up in church, we've like, you know, we're super excited because we're going to have a mansion in heaven. Um, and th- and that, that's, that's cool. Uh, I don't think that that was the point of what Jesus was saying because it more appro- appropriately uh, is, is translated this way, that there's more than enough room in my father's home or in my father's house, there is plenty of room. So he's talking about these, these, these troubles that are going to come. And then, then he brings in this weird you know, verbiage. I'll I'll go on to read, right? So there's more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, I would have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you. When everything's ready, I'll come and get you so that you'll always be with me where I am. 
and you know the way to where I'm going. No, we don't, Lord, said Thomas. We've no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? J Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. So he tells him, hey, this change is coming, and he tells him to trust, and then he tells him that there's a place for them, that there's a place for them. He tells them essentially that it's going to be troublesome, and you're going to get anxious over it, and there's going to be days that are rocky, and you're not going to be so sure, but I want you to know this one thing, that there is a place for you and a place that you belong. And I think when change happens and where hearts get overwhelmed with insecurity, the reason why he says these words is because it's the first thing that we do, is we feel like we don't, we don't belong. We feel like, well, is there going to be room for us? I don't know what it will be like. I know that none of you have thought that in this situation. I'm, I'm joking. But, but I do understand and look to the fact that Jesus knew that as well. And he reminds us of where to put our attention and where to put our heart and to recognize that we will always belong, that we will always have a place because it isn't, as we saying, it isn't about just us standing by ourselves. It's also about the fact that he stands before us. And because he stands before us, you and I can have confidence. Because he has a place for us, you and I can have security. Because he's with us, because he is there, because he knows our failure and our shame, and he knows our purpose and our destiny. He knows our goods, and he knows our bads, but he knows our goods. He knows what we have. And there's, there's always this time, right, I think if you will reflect back on high school, junior high, uh, of those awkward moments that you, you felt alone, or, or you, you know, some have walked into the cafeteria, and you didn't know where to sit, and so you looked around, and maybe just felt like awkward, and there wasn't a place for you. We, we, we can get to feeling that same way, right? Um, we still feel that way, by the way. Um, if we've ever gone out to eat with somebody or, or we're meeting a group of people and they're, they're giggling and laughing and we sort of come up, you know, or whatever, and, and we're not sure. Or, you know, even, you know, when we, when we start to take the strides of courageousness to meet new people and we're not so sure because we want to run back to everybody that we know how to have our conversations, you know. And, and, it, and the one thing that I think that, that we need to recognize is that God injects into us and, and paints a, a clear picture that there's plenty of room for us, A, because he knows we're going to go through difficulty and, and that, that situation where change is hard, but B, to remind us, here's how you can overcome. Here's how you can overcome. And these are his, his farewell message to say, I want you to always remember that I I'm going to have space. And you will never not have a place. You will never not belong because it's, it's not about anybody else. It's about me. And because of that, and because of my value, because of my love for other people, I have a place for you to fit. Now, will you surrender? Will you allow the anguish, the emotion, whatever you're feeling, to trust me in the change that I have a place for you to fit. And I think when you go through times of insecurity, if you look back, maybe it was in your teen years or maybe as you were coming into adulthood and you're starting to figure out who you were, always change brings insecurity because it's not certain because you've known and then suddenly something's different. So there's that, but nothing can, can root you and anchor you more than when your anchor is knowing there's my, there's a spot. My name is at the table. I know whenever I go to God's house, there is a seat. It is here. I am always in the family. And God always illustrates that beautiful picture of his family. And Jesus did too. When he told the story of the prodigal son, you all know it. I'm not going to tell the entire thing, but you know, the guy comes, demands his inheritance from his dad, goes out, squanders it, frivolously lives up the high life, the economy drops, and then he's rock bottom 
All his fancy friends are gone. The people that were there when he had everything are gone. And he finds himself in the pig slop. He finds himself eating, poor, broke, eating what the pigs are eating, wondering, why am I doing this? I mean, I know I'm not in God. I know I can't be in my dad's family anymore because, you know, I've screwed up royally. I know that I don't have the right to go back because I've, I've ruined He gave me my inheritance and I squandered it. It's gone. My place is gone. But at least maybe I could just be a servant or, you know, one of the hired hands because they eat better than this. So he drums up whatever courage he has and he walks the longest walk of shame you've ever seen home. And what does he find? And this is God's family. This is God's way because his ways don't make sense to us. They don't go along with our plan. This is how God's family works. Instead of the dad coming and going, oh, what are you going to do? How are you going to earn this back? The father, what does he do? He runs out. He runs out when he was still a long way off because why does he see him that far out? Because I feel like he's still looking. He's still waiting. He's still hoping that any second his boy's coming home. And so in God's family, that's how it works. And instead of him having to, you know, earn and work and labor, he walks right in. The party is set. His name is at the table. The ring is put on his hand. And suddenly he's found that his place was never gone. And the same goes, is true for us. No matter how crappy your attitude gets, no matter how much you screw up, no matter how uncertain things are, the table is set. Your name is on it. And what Jesus says is there's plenty of room. And I think that that's what he wants us to get in this transition is, hey guys, guess what? Your place is secure, but there's plenty of room. There's a lot of empty seats here. There's a lot of people in this city, their name's on the table and they don't even know it. They've never even had that hug. They don't even know that someone's waiting for them, the most functional family they've ever seen because all they've ever seen is dysfunction. So just know your name's on the table, but let's get busy because there's plenty of room. Probably one of the the, uh, pictures that God has placed on my heart I've shared with you is about the illustration about being a trophy of God's grace, right? You all know it. I talk about it a lot. If you don't know it, I'll just talk about it again. I mean, this picture, I remember I was in high school and I I got this really large trophy uh, for being the most improved player of the year, you know, when I was playing baseball. And uh, and God, you know, began to ask me a question like, Brad, what does that trophy do? I'm like, what do you mean, God? I mean, it's awesome. The trophy's awesome. He's like, no, but what does it do? And I'm like, well, I guess it doesn't really do a thing. He's like, well... It does do something. It basically, it shows off the glory and the splendor of the person who did something to earn it. And I was like, oh. And God was like, Brad, you're a trophy of my grace. And I'm like, oh, I'm a trophy of your grace. That's awesome. And he's like, yeah, you didn't do anything. (laughs) And I was like, that's true. (laughs) And I remember feeling like, wow, that's, that's, that's that's my role. My role in life is to be a trophy of God's grace. My role in life is not to work or earn his acceptance, his approval. My, my identity is not about what I've accomplished, what I haven't accomplished. And in our world and in our culture, everything vies to give us uh, confidence and to make us feel better about ourselves. I remember a buddy of mine who his father had railed him and had co- told him he would never amount to anything. And, and this guy he was so ticked off by it that he decided he was going to make this huge success of his life. And he did. And he, he worked tirelessly in hours and had a family. And then until one day that he got his enormous, you know, his trophy essentially and shoved it in his dad's face and said, see, I am worth something. And I always say like, that's terrible, you know, it's, it's not awesome because I feel that that's how we live many times because we've been hurt, because we've been abandoned, because we've been rejected. And the beauty of the gospel, the power of the gospel is in that s- simple statement of becoming a trophy of God's grace, isn't it? Because you and I every day, whether in relationships or whatever, we, we, we get convoluted and we get confused about it, but God just keeps bringing it back to us. Be a trophy of my grace. A, a, a trophy, a good one, it does show off. It just doesn't show off its efforts. It doesn't show off what it's done. But it goes all in on what someone else did. And that's the kind of community that God calls us to be in a city. 
because it gives confidence to those of us who have been the most rejected and vile in our life, and it gives us confidence still, no matter what we've done, no matter how bad it is, no matter how ugly it's been, for us to be able to have confidence because we can stand and rest assured that we're a trophy of His grace. It's why I can talk about my failure. That's why you can talk about your failure. No matter how recent or no matter how far, I will tell you one of the hardest things for me was that. Because it was, it was difficult. And then I realized that I'm a trophy of God's grace. How are other people going to experience it if I don't show that off? Not show off how miserable I was, but show off in all of that misery, God loved me. God valued me. God cared for me. And God reached out. And he took my trash and he made it treasure. God always leads us to triumph. He always leads us to a place where we will be transformed. So he tells us that we have to cling to trusting in him, trusting that he is good, trusting that he loves us, trusting that his favor surrounds us like a shield, and then trusting that there's a spot, there's a place, that if we will be comfortable in his grace, if we will be comfortable in his ability, if we'll be comfortable in the fact that he knows the end from the beginning, if we will be comfortable in knowing that there's room that God will begin to do some things for us, for me, for you, for our children, for this city, for the people who are broken and rejected and those people who need to hear what you're hearing this morning, that God loves them and God has a place for them before they believe before they behave, right? And it's called church. And it's you and me. That, that's, that's his picture. That's, that's what he leaves the disciples with as a last sort of speech, as, as a way to invest into them. He says, I think you're ready. But don't forget these things. Just trust me. We've spent time together. We've, we've been together. You know that I love you. You've watched as I've picked up the broken and the hurting. You've seen how I reacted to those who were rejected. And I want you to do that too. And in order for you to be able to do that, you're going to have to love love people the way that I love them. Remember, there's going to be religious things that will come up. You'll, You'll even deal with it. There'll be times when you've done some Bible reading and some prayer and went to a few things and you'll be like, I'm awesome. You're not awesome. You're only awesome because I'm awesome. And that's why you're awesome. Don't forget it. All right? And God wants us to be fully confident, fully loved, fully valuable, but he wants us to execute on the gifts that he's given to us as well. He wants us to be utilized. And he will not leave you. He has your back. Can I get a louder amen than that? It does. Not one of us, not one of us has to hold our heads down. But in fact, just the opposite is is true for us. I believe as a church and as a community that has been through so many amazing things. How many of you are more confident of God's love than you were several months, years, whatever it is? I mean, how many of you would say... How many of you know that I've spoken about that subject quite a bit over the years? <laughs> it was by design. Hey. It's good. Because there isn't anything. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, 8, mm. that love never ceases to be effective. When you, when you doubt or you're unsure of your response, when, you, when you're not 100% this or that, guess what? Love never ceases to be effective. When you feel like, because this, this may happen as you grow, it's happened for me, and, and I've, I've, I've come in contact with certain situations, and I always go back to, what does love do? How does love act? When, when you're broken and you're hurt because somebody else has done something to you, how do you respond? How do you react? How do you react? 
And we've, we've seen that in our marriage. We've seen that in your lives. And it becomes, for us, the, uh, the, the simplicity of, of our, essentially, our last discourse together is to say, you know what? God's got our back. There's more than enough room. There's so many empty seats and so many people that need your story, that need you to step forward and to stand, to open up your hearts, to open up your lives, to open up your homes, to open up your backyards. It's time to get busy because the church is people. Always has been, always will be. It's not about pastors on pedestals or seat stools or stools. It's actually about you. This is a moment in the time where you and I, we step forward and, and fully with the confidence that God's given to us because of his value and his worth, we begin to lift our eyes to look out and say, God, use me. God, lead me. God, guide me. God, open my life in all of that I've been through in every situation, in every circumstance so that I can love other people and I can see people come to know your love. It's pretty simple. It sure gets convoluted quite a bit. But I, if you ask me, Brad, what are you about? What, are, what is your family about? It's about love never ceasing to be effective so that we can begin to lift up some people who feel broken and bruised, invite them into the family, have a couple parties with them, enjoy some life, and watch their gifts be reproduced so that we can see our city transformed by the grace and the love and the goodness of God. Are you with me? Yes. So, do you have anything else that you want to? I think the only thing that Brad has said over the years, and we, we were like thinking about what we were going to say today, and we thought we'd like go through every Bradism, you know, like his throw the hand. And he loves when you remember them, because if you forget, apparently it's not good. I learned the hard way. <laughs> He's like, don't you remember all of them? So we have told you to throw your hammer. Uh, oh, so we're going to talk about them. We have told you to get your shift together. We have told you do, do not shit on yourselves. Got margin. Get margin. Live out of margin. It wasn't as fun as those other ones I talked okay. about. <laughs> but one thing that he said that I love, and I think that this is like our soundbite for us walking out these doors, is that as, as we walk out today, that as a community who is loved, fully loved, fully secure in who God is, fully secure that we have a place at the table, that we would walk, do you guys know what I'm about to say? Except for Betsy, who has the notes in front of her. Uh, we would walk like John, oh my gosh, they don't know it. You haven't said Travolta. it. Travolta. John Travolta. And serve like. Mother Teresa. Wow. <laughs> my mom does this sometimes. She goes through like her I'm thing. I'm not sure. I mean, there's probably quite a few who don't know who yeah, John, they, John, John Travolta, Travolta is. Okay, so <laughs> why would we walk like John Travolta? What does he do? Because I didn't invent this thing. Because John Travolta was awesome, and uh, he walked down the he street was like, with some He swagger. had like some swag, yeah. So we're asking for swagger and confidence, and then to serve with the heart that is compassionate and loving and lifting and builds up. Yes. Others. And, and we're, we love you guys so much. We are excited. Obviously, next week, we are going to be in the Performing Arts Center. And, uh, and what we're asking every, every one of us is to come early, come excited, come with smiles, come with confidence, come ready to worship, come ready to give your hearts, come ready to hang out, come ready to invite somebody to lunch, come ready to see because this is what Jesus always said to the tax collector and the broken and whatever. He always just said, come and see. And that's all, all we're desiring is for you and I and all of us to just come and see and, and to be able to realize what God has in store. So, In our heart, one more thing that I just thought of is it's so f like when you're proud of someone and proud of who they are and their heart, like, especially if they're your family, it's like, my mom's in town, my brother's in town, I can't wait for you to meet them. And I think that Brad and I feel that same, like, I can't wait for you guys to, we've been bragging on you. So live up to it, okay? I'm it was, just it was, it was funny for those of us who were at the, at the baseball game yesterday, um, you know, there was a little bit of, uh, 
of, you know, we, we had a, kind of a, a, a little event to bring some people together, and we're going to have another sort of dinner tonight right here, and, and everybody is invited to come and kind of hang out. But I noticed that we, we sort of, the adults are kind of like, you know, just a little, it's, it's that awkwardness, like, you know, you know, like the school dance or the cafeteria. But my son Jackson, Jackson, he runs up to every person, and he hugs them, and he shows them his ninja moves, and he like spins, and then he's hugging, and I'm like... I love that kid. That kid is awesome. So what I want is for you to show Lots off of ninja moves. your ninja moves. Yes. And I want you to hug some necks. And I want you to be able to, uh, to, to step out in the full confidence that you are a trophy of God's grace. Amen? Yes. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we are so incredibly grateful for all that you have done and you're doing in our lives. God, I'm so thankful for the message of the power of your unconditional love. I, I truly am. This is not just words that we sing, just saying, Jesus loves me, this I know. But God, I know that. And I ask that you would embed that into our hearts. Because knowing it fully, experiencing it at the depth of our emotion helps to get past the pain of where our parents have rejected us, where people of importance have let us down and said things. God, your love, the fact that you are a father that is good to us. Man, that helps. Father, I'm asking that you would just begin to reshape uh, the way and the perspectives that we have had that sometimes get overwhelmed by insecurity. And I'm thanking you, Lord, that you're beginning to move within our hearts to love people in a greater magnitude, to serve people in a greater magnitude, to share our stories in a greater capacity than we ever have before as we take more and more confident steps in you. Because in you, we find our peace. In you, we find our place. In you, we find our true identity, God. In you, we find out in these brief years and moments that we have on this planet that you are cultivating something so rich and so incredible within us. And God, we want to be in on what you're doing because you are all about love. And God, we are thankful for your grace. We're thankful for your mercy and passion to treat us better than we deserve. And we're ready to lavish it on others and to be able to seize the fullness of what you want to use our lives for in this day and in this hour. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Someone whisper.